So hi, everyone. Um, before we start, I wanted to, uh, to frame perhaps a little bit uh, who is Amazon and what we do. So a lot of people know Amazon.com, Amazon.fr here, or from other European countries. What we build really is a uh, is platform for users, right? So uh, now a lot of people know the Amazon Marketplace. That is, anyone here can sell whatever you want on, uh, on Amazon. Uh, you can also be a publisher. That is, you don't, find, you don't need to find a publisher to sell your book. You can sell your book directly to, to Kindle. And uh, with Amazon Web Services, basically, you can build whatever IT system with those kind of Lego bricks or components that basically range from anything to storage on virtual machines. There's more than 35 services now. So what I wanted to discuss now is uh, uh, I wanted to be really practical. Uh, those are five different ways uh, we see Amazon Web Services are customers using AWS uh, enabling their uh, lean IT teams. So let's start with the first one. So a lot of people talk about experimentation and innovation and so on, but um, if you come from, uh, from big organizations, you know that usually, I mean, people want to innovate, right? I mean, everyone wants to say that they are innovative, that they want to try new ideas, but the problem is uh, the cost is usually killing innovation. And in IT, it happens a lot. So I saw many, uh, for example, business intelligence applications or projects or data warehouse projects, those are the classic ones, that have been killed because there is no way to really prove the return on investment of those projects, right? Today, if you want to start a data warehouse, let's say the classic way with physical hardware, um, the ticket entry cost is something like 200,000 euros, right? So. For 2,000 euros, or usually it's more half a million euros, how are you going to, if you're not able to really um, explain the return on investment on this, uh, usually your project is going to die, right? I mean, no one is going to continue. So the key thing to, to increase innovation and to help innovation is to lower the cost of failure, right? And um, it's not only lowering the cost of failure to entry and to start innovating, but it's also for the long term. We, uh, we the the previous speaker just mentioned that uh, just mentioned that you have to go fast and so on because, I mean, if you have armies of consultants or if your team is stuck like during six months on a project, this is also something that adds to the cost. So you have to, with the metrics you you are collecting, you have to understand quickly when you need to stop, right? You need to fail fast and fail uh, low cost. So basically, this is what a platform like a cloud computing platform or like Amazon Web Services gives you. Because if you have, like, let's say, unlimited capacity, uh, you don't have uh, capital expenditure. That is, you don't have to pay upfront any fee to start using the platform. And like the electricity, you only pay for what you consume, and everything is available on demand, like in a, in a couple of seconds or in a couple of minutes. Basically, you're removing the constraints that allow you to innovate. And let me show you a, a couple of examples. So just to, to have the idea is clear, this is a um, one page of our public pricing. I, I don't want to sell you anything, but just to fix the idea on your mind that today, for example, a, a physical machine or a virtual machine, you can have it a couple of seconds for, well, roughly less than a dollar per, uh, per hour, right? Um, all the prices are public in, in many cloud computing platforms, so you can go on the website and check and compare. Uh, the key thing here, and the other reason why I'm showing the prices is because um, if you look at the past and if you look at the future, Amazon Web Services, for example, we exist since 2006, so eight years, right? Uh, we lowered the prices 45 times. And th the point for us, the ultimate goal is, as I mentioned, cloud computing is a little bit like electricity. When you enter a room, you turn on the lights, you don't think about the cost of electricity. Right? So for us, the, the main objective in IT is this. That is, you need, you need a, like uh, a data warehouse, you need machines, you need storage. I mean, you don't think about the cost of, of this. This is just IT, right? This is easy, what I'm, uh, what I'm selling you. The most complex part is what you guys are going to build on top of this. So ultimately, the objective is to render the cost so low that you don't even think about the IT infrastructure that is holding it. So um, a couple of examples, um, uh, VisiWare, a French company, I don't know if uh, people are familiar with the game, uh, who wants to be a billionaire, qui veut gagner des millions in French, right? So you can play with your mobile device, and this is kind of a use case that has been enabled by uh, cloud computing companies. If you think also about uh, Olympic games and so on, um, 
Well, those are events that last for a couple of weeks or for this, just uh, a couple of hours per day. So by using these kind of platforms, it enabled this company to, uh, uh, to basically have a complete infrastructure that sustains uh, uh, more than 5 million users in two hours uh, at a cost that goes uh, below 500 euros for one, uh, for one TV show. Right, because you only pay for what you consume. Right, it would be completely crazy to buy or to rent a data center uh, just to do a TV show once every two weeks. Right, and and another one is uh, now a lot of uh, system integrators or consultancy companies understand that because uh, the first Jeff this morning uh, uh, talk about Scrum and uh, well, you know, for those practicing Scrum or Agile's methodologies, you want to have feedback from your users. Right. Um, but if you don't have a test environment for them to try what you are doing, how they are going to give you feedback. So this is why, what now many of my, my customers are doing, uh, even in France, basically you are establishing a VPN connection between you and Amazon Web Services, you launch a couple of virtual machines every Friday afternoon, and every Friday afternoon your customer knows that he can connect to the test environment and see your progress. And then Monday morning you have a nice email with the feedback, the customer was able to have like a team connecting to the test environment, tell you what's going right and what's going wrong on a, an environment that is going to look at the production environment at the end. And you pay that for the cost of a, of a lunch for the, for the afternoon, right? So uh, a couple of other examples. Um, I think uh, I'm pretty sure people know Autodesk. So now they are going into the 3D printing, uh, 3D printing business and they are porting their software to web applications. So um, Autodesk, if um, it's the leading software company for engineering, so they, they give you software that allows you to like, build bridges, houses, whatever. And uh, now it's moving to web applications because on a, on a cloud computing environment, they have the uh, computing power to do all the complex processing tasks on behind, right? And they, they push so far that now you can even do it with a mobile phone. But the mobile phone, I mean, it's difficult to, to design something on a small screen. So they had this, uh, this application that basically allowed you to take pictures to scan a 3D object and to then reshape the model based on the pictures you are taking. So even if our cell phones are really powerful today, I mean, they're not powerful yet to do these kind of things. And this is the kind of innovations that have been, uh, that have been tested by Autodesk, right? So in the past, uh, well, they didn't even thought about it because uh, it will require too many resources. Let me give you an another example on this. Um, one of the one of the instance types you can uh, you can rent on Amazon Web Services is what we call the GPU instances. They have this kind of uh, um, 3D processing cards that have multiple GPUs, allowing you to do floating point operations extremely fast. Right. So uh, one of the companies who, who started using that is Schrodinger. I'll come to that. But the interesting mechanics of cloud computing is that. For example, this is a, a one of those uh, instances, this one that is rented by one of our customers uh, called Eagle Genomics. And to scan a complete human DNA, it takes them four hours in, in those machines. A human, a human DNA sequence is uh, 300 gigabytes, something like this. But the thing is, so um, if you take this machine four hours, uh, so times the, the cost per hour is less than $10. But if you take four machines during four hours, it's exactly the same cost, right? Because I'm, I'm renting uh, capacity by the hour, so it's exactly the same, but you have the results four times faster, <laughs> right? And this is something that uh, the, these customers, Krodinger, did. So th this company specialized in, uh, um, in uh, cancer research. And uh, when I met them a couple of years ago to, to build the first infrastructure, um, they... I had like the, the naive thinking that when you do research, you, you send a couple of researchers to the Amazonian forest and they are going to study bugs and flowers and these kind of things and find new molecules that are ultimately going to cure cancer. But they tell me, no, 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 it doesn't work like this, right? It's, uh, it's definitely not like this anymore. Uh, now the researchers, they don't go to the Amazon forest, they work in front of computers, right? So what they do is they, uh, they modelize those proteins. So this is a protein that is involved in the pancreas cancer. Uh, and that's why DNA analysis is uh, such a hot topic now when you think about cloud computing, because when you analyze the DNA sequences, you can remodel those proteins that come from the DNA, uh, uh, the DNA model. So the idea here is that they run on computer simulations where basically you want to break this protein because this protein is causing the cancer cells, right? 
And for that, you have to find those tiny molecules that fit into the structure of the protein and can break it or alter the, uh, the shape, right? And uh, when you're in IT, when you have a catalog of uh, millions of those molecules like this, it sounds a lot like a, a brute force attack, right? When you are trying to guess passwords to enter into a system. So the, here it's exactly the same. I have a protein, I have a database of millions of molecules, and I want to, to test everything, right? So this is exactly what, what they did. And um, uh, I think you, perhaps you don't see the graph correctly, but in this, in this axis, those are hours. So they started at uh, 9 p.m., 10, uh, 11, and midnight. And here the graph is not, is not cutted. It's that uh, it ends, right? And if you go up here, this is uh, 50,000. So they started 50,000 machines uh, in uh, three hours to do uh, this, uh, this modelization. And uh, a bit after three hours, they ended up the simulation because they found the result. And the interesting thing when I was talking about lowering the cost of innovation is that the whole simulation for three hours costed something like $15,000 compared to the initial plan, which was to build a complete data center from the ground up uh, just to do this for $20 million. And uh, the US government was about to pay half of this. So th this is the, the real point of, uh, of this kind of uh, cloud computing platform is that really to, to erase all the cost of everything uh, that is related to the hardware, right? Because it shouldn't be this that limits your ideas, right? So the second point, uh, as Jeff also mentioned, is to, is to measure everything. But I wanted to give it a different twist because we started talking about cost, is that um, this is a, a, a very well-known quote for everything working in operations, that is, if you don't measure things, it doesn't happen. And it's exactly the same with cost variation. Today, the problem in IT is also that it's very difficult to understand what's the cost of running your, your applications, right? Can you really tell me if you have like uh, a data center uh, running your applications, what's the cost of your complete emailing service, for example? Or what's the cost of your ticketing system, right? So. The thing here is that we have many customers like this one. This is a picture I took at uh, uh, Etsy. Of course, you have those metrics of uh, uh, business logs, uh, uh, CPU consumption, memory consumption, number of, number of users, and so on. But the point here is to also add the cost of a solution as a metric, which will then, in turn, allow you to uh, lower the cost of your system by fine-tuning this, uh, this metric. So this is a screenshot of my, my dashboard. So, when you, when you log on the system, you have metrics that really show you how much, uh, how much cost you are you're using, how, how much infrastructure you're using, and, and compare that to the cost, which basically at the end, I'm, I'm skipping those ones uh, quickly, allow you to, to set alarms also on, on, uh, on, on cost elevation, right? Because the metrics you want to have is, on, is not only in terms of usage and, in, and also in terms of uh, visitors you have, but also in terms of cost of your infrastructure. Is my infrastructure or is my system uh, also sustainable compared to the, uh, to the cost that I'm allowed to, uh, to give it to it? So one of the other things is also to be able to have recommendations that allow you to lower also your cost. And the, and the idea here is, again, to continue to, uh, to fine tune your system up to a way that the ideal of any IT system will be to have the cost of the IT system dependent on the number of users, right? So um, the third point, if you start experimenting and you start measuring everything, is to recognize that you're going to fail. Again, um, the previous speakers mentioned that. And uh, um, the point here is, um, uh, of course, we're in a, in a, in a society that um, focuses on good things. You don't hire a consultant because the guy did many mistakes, right? Usually those guys, they are fired and you, you never see them. You hire people because they did good stuff, right? But the thing is, if you look at many organizations that are uh, focusing in risky environments like the, uh, the military, uh, industry, uh, healthcare, and so on, they always do uh, post-mortems and very deep analysis of debris because you want to learn from failures, right? And uh, um, actually, I had the chance to, uh, to work a lot with the um, uh, top executive management at Amazon. And uh, uh, it's, it's not specific to Amazon, but in many, uh, in many big IT companies, uh, the top executives have a very harsh reputation of uh, yelling to their employees to be really harsh and so on. And 
I learned about the time that um, it's actually a feature, right? Um, when you have a hard time with your boss, you're going to remember this. And this is the feature. And uh, actually, I thought that perhaps my, my boss is not like uh, uh, a, a jerk or a very bad guy, uh, but it's just that he wants me to remember uh, bad things. And that's why failures are making us better. So there's, uh, there's also this concept that you also learn uh, through very hard times, right? And one of the problems in IT is that uh, usually, well, uh, when those hard times uh, happen, we don't, we don't learn on this. So uh, at Amazon, and now many companies are, uh, are doing it, we develop the concept of, uh, of game days, which is not something new. We call it game days because the industry started to call it game days. It started with security simulation or intrusions of, uh, of uh, hacker simulations. And uh, the idea is to, do, to have a complete simulated environment. So this is a very old simulator of, uh, of one of the early Boeings uh, because it was uh, a plane that was very difficult to land. So we wanted to, to train the pilots to, to land the, uh, the aircraft and to do it in a controlled environment so they don't crash the thing. And for example, this picture, those two guys seem very happy, but they just crashed the airplane, <laughs> right? Uh, but because it's a simulated environment, it's fine, it's okay. So the, the thing goes like this, because you have um, a complete environment, for example, on Amazon Web Services that you pay only for what you use and that you can use to mimic a test environment, um, how many people ask it for a, a test environment and they got like an old Pentium 3 machines from 10 years ago or something like that. Uh, I mean, when you're in an environment where you pay only for what you consume, you can do this kind of uh, test environment where you can simulate all kinds of things. So you have two teams, let's say the supervisors and the players, and uh, the idea is first you, you, you make a plan. What, what do you want to test? And um, uh, for example, you want to test a database failure. You want to test all kinds of uh, system changes. Or one of the, the tests that I like the most is in, uh, in many operational IT teams, there's always one or two guys who are the hotshots. They know everything about the system. They know all the passwords and so on. So you want to test what happens when those guys are not there. Right, they are in a wedding, they are on vacation, and so on. So they are not there. Another good way to uh, this is something that I strongly encourage you to do uh, to have ideas of what you can test is to do a pre mortem. So, so the exercise is a bit weird. Is you you gather your team and you ask them to to imagine what are the any kind of possible things that may happen that could uh, completely crash a system. Right, it can be anything. Just brainstorm on what what could crash. And this is also good from a, a sociological perspective and from a cultural perspective because we all hate failure. This is normal. I mean, we've been trained to try to avoid failure, so we don't like to. Uh, uh, we don't like when we fail. But when we are asked to try to imagine the different ways how we fail, here we are working together to be imaginative. So it, wor it works extremely well. And then, well, you set a date. You invite everyone, right? And uh, and that's it. So you want to create an environment. Uh, here, obviously, you want to separate that from a production environment. This is perhaps the best practice for people using Amazon Web Services. So you have different billing, you know the different costs, and so on. And um, now with cloud computing environments, you have also ways to completely redeploy an architecture. So here is a very simple system. The, my point here is that with a simple text file, you can describe a production environment. You give this text file to, uh, to the cloud environment, and we are going to recreate the system. Right? So many, uh, many customers today use it for disaster recovery, for on-demand disaster recovery. So you can also do it to recreate an environment that you are going to use for the game day. So then you need to simulate some activity because if the system is not doing anything, it's, it's not very useful. Right? So there's um, one of my favorite ways to do it is to record network activity. So um, I have one of my, uh, my customers, for example, uh, uh, Instagram, they recorded the network activity when Justin Bieber joined and created an account. So uh, the, the point of recording this activity is that then you can replay it anytime you want in the test environment, right? Because the, the difficulty, of course, you can do it with load testing and so on. But when you record network activity, you are going to record what real users are doing in the system, right? Um, then the, the, the second thing is, uh, as I mentioned, you can uh, 
generate a bunch of machines to just load test and try to, to crash your system to see what happens. Uh, this is what many customers are doing, uh, not only in the financial sector, but also in the gaming industry. For example, uh, this is a screenshot of a, uh, of a game, um, a Call of Duty, where basically before releasing the game, they want to test if the system uh, is sustainable or is able to sustain like multiple millions of players. So this is also something that you can uh, use to, to test your environment during the, during the game day. So, uh, one point that I, uh, that I saw many times uh, when you do game days is that there is no clear communication channels. When something goes wrong, everyone starts screaming, trying to call the cell phones, trying to call, uh, beep the pagers, and so on, but if there is no defined uh, communication channel, this is really bad, usually, because, I mean, the, you, you cannot coordinate teams. So then, the simulation of the failures, right? So uh, this is when you do the real exercise of, for example, uh, here, well, one engine is, uh, is on fire, or for example, in your system, uh, the database replica is lost, or the master load balancer failed, what happens, right? So there's multiple ways to do it from a technical perspective. I'll not dive into the, the, the technical details. We can, we can discuss that. But actually, there's some customers that do it uh, even in production systems. So Netflix is a very well-known uh, customer of Amazon Web Services. They created this open source project called Chaos Monkey. Chaos Monkey is basically a software that is going to randomly kill servers, <laughs> right? And uh, well, Netflix, as you know, is a, is a company that is doing uh, video streaming. So the point here is that if a company that is doing live video streaming is randomly killing on purpose their servers on production environment and can sustain that, that's definitely a proof that the system is, uh, is resilient, right? So, I mean, if you don't do it in production environment, at least do it in a test environment. This is also a good thing to do during the, uh, during the game days. And then comes the, the play part. So, uh, I, I, I did it again uh, many times, and, uh, and sometimes uh, product managers told me, well, I, you know, we are not going to simulate this failure. This is never gonna happen. Yes, it's going to happen. Life is really, really harsh, and uh, you know, like the day uh, your son is going to crash, uh, um, the the storage engineer is going to be uh, stuck in the subway because guess what? He's in Paris and there's a strike. And uh, uh, anyway, uh, many things are going to are going to happen like this. So um, we have also tools that you can find in other ways that are critical in the, in those game days. You have to record all the activity. This is going to be useful for the debrief. So the activity is what people do, what are all of the actions they took. So obviously this is way easier to do in an IT environment where you can record all the logs. So definitely do it. Um, and the debrief, um, this is where the good ideas uh, happen, right? Because uh, this is when you, you, you question things with a, a drinking a beer. You, want, you don't want to do like a strict debrief that is perhaps a bit too aggressive or written. You want to do it very in a, in a nice way, in a, in a friendly way. So the debrief here is when people are going to understand how the failure happened. Because, for example, I, I organized once a game day and we invited the engineers and we, we told them, look guys, we are going to simulate how the web servers are going to fail today. Okay, so they came and they prepared themselves. Obviously, this is not what we did. What we did is crash the databases, right? <laughs> because, I mean, what's the point for you to know what's going to happen, right? So. Um, <laughs> And, and, and this is when you really, uh, when you see people start to learn and to really take ownership of, okay, the system failed because of this, I know how to fix it, and so on, right? So one of the key things here is, uh, is to understand how long it takes you to detect an event, to detect a failure. Because if during a game day, like during a situation where you expect things to crash, it takes you five minutes to detect a failure, in the real environment, it's going to take you one hour. Right, so this is also one of the one of the good learnings. And again, I come back to this to the uh, to the communication channel and, and chain of command. Uh, I saw sometimes uh, people freaking out just because they, I mean, they had many options. They didn't know what to do. Who who will decide? And basically, they went stuck. Right. So um, before joining Amazon, I was working once in the European Parliament, and uh, uh, the day before uh, a big voting in the parliament, moment, uh, we lost one of the uh, one of the master Oracle databases, and I saw the uh, uh, the database engineer uh, literally crying, 
right? And uh, because he, he didn't know what to do, and uh, he wasn't able to uh, to contact his chain of command. So again, this is something that you learn very well from uh, from military environments, but also uh, in any kind of environments where you have like a, a strong need in reliability. So the point here again of the of the game days, I was a bit long in this uh, uh, in this section, is to as uh, Jeff also mentioned, validate your assumptions from the operations perspective, prove that your architectures do what they do, and also know the procedures. Know what the, procedure, the procedures you need to apply when things fail. So the fourth point is to um, iterate and move fast. Okay, so um, there's a story that I always like to, uh, like to tell when I talk about iterations, is uh, uh, an experiment that has been done in, uh, in France and in, the, um, in Berlin about um, uh, quality versus um, uh, versus quantity, right? So uh, just just before that, the experiment w w was like this. So they took a team of students that had nothing to to do with art, and they asked them to build uh, tea clay pots, right? So they went for uh, mathematicians, uh, uh, commerce guys, and so on, and basically they separated them in two teams. They say, well, one team you guys have unlimited amount of time, but you build one tea clip clay pot, and it has to be the best quality that you can do, right? And the other team is, you guys have batches of five minutes to, buy, uh, to build uh, clay pots, but you have a limited amount of, of clay, but you only run into, into iterations, right? You do one, and then after five minutes, you do another one. So guess what? The team who had uh, only five minutes are the ones who ultimately did the best quality because they learn from their failures, right? So the point here was to be able to iterate and try a lot of, uh, a lot of different ways. So um, uh, this guy, Lord Dyson, uh, is well known for his vacuum cleaners, uh, but one of the things that, that people don't know is that he built more than 5,000 prototypes before selling the first model, right? So 5,000. Uh, obviously, it's way easier for us if you work in the IT industry, because as Jeff mentioned, um, Amazon is pushing updates quite quite frequently, and um, those sometimes are not very complex updates. Is sometimes we just change the font um, of the price or the position of the button. Um, this is some kind of a vanity metric, <laughs> uh, but uh, my point here is not to to brag about how frequently we push things because I mean you can think about like we are completely schizophrenic, right? We push an update and oh it was wrong. We push another one. Oh this was wrong too. So th the point is more to show you. Uh, that you should be able to push an update whenever you need it, right? So uh, too often I see teams that are stuck and they say, okay, we need to push an update, we need to plan for three months or two months of deployment. This is completely crazy, right? How do you want to innovate and get feedback if every time you want to test something, uh, you need to wait for, I don't know, for, for two months? So the point here of this slide is, is really to, to show you that you have to be able to, to push your product to your customers as quickly as possible, regardless you have 10,000 nodes or just two nodes, right? It has, to be, it has to be quick because, I mean, technically, if you can do it quickly with two servers, you can do it quickly with 10,000 usually, right? So uh, it's not only Amazon who is doing it. Uh, Etsy is doing it um, uh, as well. They do a push to production every, every 20 minutes. And another thing that is important when you want to go uh, as quickly as possible is to, is to have very lean teams. So the first Jeff of the morning uh, said that um, uh, the, I think it was five, right? The the the, the right number for uh, for a, a team size. So at Amazon we have another concept that is called the two pizza teams. So uh, you have to be able to feed your team with only two pizzas. If you need more, uh, your team is too big. <laughs> <laughs> it, it sounds a bit silly. I, I prefer Jeff's definition of five. At least it's a good number. <laughs> Uh, I can eat one pizza myself alone, so, <laughs> uh, and I'm definitely not a team. But anyway, uh, this is something that you see also in other uh, in other companies. Like for example, Instagram, they the operations team is just only two guys, right? One pizza each. Um, Airbnb is uh, is also is also a big one. The operation team is uh, is uh, five people. And uh, my point here is not to tell you you should fire all your IT team and keep the best guys, right? Uh, no, my, my point is to, is to tell you that, that with the right tools and the, with the right procedures, you can achieve way more than what you think of. 
And this leads me to, uh, to the last point of my presentation, which is um, focusing on your business or, or focusing on your users or your customers, right? So I wanted to, to highlight those uh, two customers of uh, Amazon Web Services. Um, they are interesting from different ways. So, so Dropbox, I assume everyone knows the, the, the file sharing service. Uh, believe it or not, but Dropbox, they are not in the business of storing files. It's not their business. Uh, if you're using Dropbox today, technically you're using Amazon S3. So Dropbox runs on Amazon Web Services. All the files that you put are stored on Amazon S3. Dropbox is in the business of making it easy for you to store and exchange files. The storage, it's not their business, right? NASA is a bit the same. So NASA is perhaps one of the organizations that has the best engineers in the world. Right, um, but for the, for example, for the Mars rover missions, the analysis of the image and the data that is sent by the Mars rover is done on Amazon Web Services. Why? Because it's not their business to build and operate data centers. Samsung is exactly the same. If you if you bought a Samsung TV and you have the um, uh, uh, the the smart TV application, the backend runs on Amazon Web Services because again. Even if the, co the company definitely has the funds to build as many data centers as they want, it's not their business to operate it. So I think that the key uh, for any organization is to really understand what you want to do and what you don't want to do, right? Because uh, we're all familiar with the concept of to-do list, things that we want to do and so on, but often there's way too, ma too many things that we want to do. So focus on the, your core value and uh, have clear what you don't want to do. So. I mean, here the point is definitely to, to remove waste, and unfortunately, where you see, what you see in, in IT operations is, um, is, this, uh, is this cost uh, distribution. Um, usually, 70% of the cost of an uh, IT operation team is spent on what I call the undifferentiated heavy lifting. That is, for example, uh, doing backups, um, taking care of the network, managing the hardware, pushing upgrades, and so on. And only 30% of the budget is kept on innovating, right, and doing things that are right for the business. So the goal of, an, uh, of Amazon Web Services is really to flip this equation, to uh, remove all the things that are not giving any value to your business and to allow you to focus more on what is important, right? So those were the, uh, the five main points that I, wanted to, uh, that I wanted to discuss today. One last thing before we go to the questions is um, perhaps the... Um, the most important one is to focus on your customers. This is a, a very well-known quote from uh, Jeff Bezos, and uh, he said that when the, uh, in the 2000s when the uh, dot-com uh, bubble crashed and uh, when uh, other companies started to do e-commerce, and suddenly everyone said, well, Amazon is going to die because there's too many competitors, like uh, Barnes & Noble and so on is going to enter the business. And uh, he said that, well, don't look at the competition because, I mean, those guys are not going to give you any money, right? Focus on the guys who are going to give you money, who are going to use your service, which are your customers, right? And with that, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.